Hey, good morning. I am Elizabeth Melton. I'm the Public Engagement Director for the Institute for Diversity and Civic Life, and I am conducting interviews with the Luce Foundation's COVID-19 Emergency Grant Network uh, for the Grounded Knowledge Project. I am here with Santana Alvarado, and we are meeting via Zoom. Today is Monday, January 20. Oh, no, that's not the correct date. Today is Monday, February 5th, 2024. Um, Santana, can you please introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Santana Alvarado. I'm here based in Baltimore City, Maryland. I work as Senior Project Manager for the Center for Religion and Cities at Morgan State University, and I'm also a community organizer and artist. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, to get started, can you tell me a little bit about your work? Uh, with the center and how how you kind of got connected with them? Yes, I heard about the center through um, a, a report email that came out looking for um, some fellows. And I saw that they were onboarding some fellows for a new initiative called the Lifeways of Hope, funded by the Henry Luce Foundation. And I applied as a fellow, which felt a little less aligned, and then I applied as a project manager that they were looking for to manage the grant, and I got an interview, and I was able to share some of my experiences working with nonprofits in New York City as a project manager and community outreach coordinator, and I was offered the position in September of 2022, and just for the past year and a half-ish, um, I've been really learning about what it looks like to project manage with communities in mind and with large funders and stakeholders in mind as well, while not sacrificing the initial integrity of what people coming together in a room, getting excited and dreaming possibilities for a better quality of life. Um, not losing that while trying to meet our stakeholders' needs and our funders' needs. So it's been pretty much like all day-to-day -day things. I'm, you know, in charge of the daily operations of the center, as well as working on specific grants from the Henry Luce Foundation, from the Mellon Foundation, um, and just making sure that from start to finish, we're doing what we said we were going to do in our application, and we are following through on reporting after each, you know, timed period and making sure that we are getting those reports in and, and expressing gratitude for what we've been able to accomplish and having a really meaningful moment of reflection while also gearing up for new projects and new grants. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, I have kind of like two different questions that that may overlap and may not. Um, one, I'm interested to know and kind of like what the daily life of a project manager looks like, but also um, are there any particular projects that are standing out to you right now that you've been able to to work on or things that um, that like really challenged you or helped you learn a lot? So maybe there's something there of like when you were working on a certain project, what did your daily life look like? I don't know. Yeah, so the daily life of a project manager is rigorous. It's definitely wearing several hats and having to learn how to delegate and set boundaries because sometimes I feel like, oh, I'll just do it myself. It takes a quick 10 minutes. But the joy and the challenge of being a project manager is you have a diverse team with different needs, with different strengths, with different goals, and having to really um, tap people to accomplish certain things and manage them. So managing projects is really about managing people first and foremost, and serving as a cheerleader, as sometimes that voice that's like, okay, guys, stop messing around. We got to do it. I There's this hilarious meme that was like, what are the best methods of getting people to do what you need as a project manager? And it was like sending updates, showing them the Gantt charts, showing them these things. And then the one that ended up working was yelling, which I never recommend just yelling at people, but it is that energy that it shows like, oh, you're managing people. And if you have skills and, and experience with working with people, you know that they require some reminding, some shepherding, some straight up assistance. Like I'll sit with you in this meeting and we'll do this together. 
Um, and a lot of checking in and making sure that things are running smoothly. Because, for example, the grant that comes to my mind is the, well, I can bring up the Henry Luce Foundation grant since that's who we're here um, shouting out. So the HLF grant, Lifeways of Hope, is a four-year project. And right now I'm in this process of the midpoint, two years in, we have to do a halfway through the grant report and just making sure that folks understand, like, to my knowledge, I have a certain treetop view, bird's eye view of, okay, everything that people are working on. And that's been some of the struggles that we've faced as a center is everyone's doing these incredible projects, but is there a lot of cross-pollination? Do people know what other labs and teams are working on? Um, or is it just Santana as project manager who knows everything and is able to then fill in as opposed to folks reaching out to each other? So encouraging some cross-pollination and just encouraging folks, hey, you know, we did such amazing work. We want to celebrate that through accurate reporting and through understanding that reporting is not fun. You know, no one wants to sit down and you know, that, that, that even after an event, like you're feeling amazing. Wow, we did these incredible community events. The Henry Luce Foundation supported the release of a book that I edited. So I became an editor for a moment, you know, because the project manager just, just steps up and does whatever is needed. And that was the Urban Farm Plantation Park Heights Urban Farm. And we put out a book and that was such a rush and an amazing feeling. And in that moment, you're not thinking, oh, let me go home fill out a Google form that has everything we're in and, and make sure that I'm accurately to our funders expressing quantitative and qualitative data of how successful this project was. So that is kind of where we're at with HLF right now is this middle point of like, let's reflect on the past two years while simultaneously running programming that's already in the works for this year too, and thinking about, okay, what does the next couple years look like as we close out this grant? So it does require to be like, you have to be in the weeds, you have to be in the emails, you have to be dealing with personalities that you know you may or may not love at any given moment. You have to be um, serving as that cheerleader, serving as that, you know, sometimes helicopter parent, maybe that's the better way to say it. Um, and also willing to do some things yourself. Like I can easily report on things because I was part of a lot of these projects that these different labs were operating. So being able to do some of it yourself while also reminding, hey guys, hey guys, and reminding them it's not easy. So I know you guys are blowing off my email. Oh, 50 days away. I don't have to worry about the report, but no, we do because we know that 50 days, I mean, it's already 2024 and I feel like it's almost going to be over, which is not true, but in the sense that time moves fast and when you're worried about so many other things, you're not necessarily thinking about, okay, how can I do these in the weed moments? And then of course, intervening and saying, like I said earlier, hey, I'll sit down with you. Let's fill this out together. So lots of hats, lots of patience. Lots of creativity and finding ways to solve problems and create new ideas for collaboration. I think innovation is a big plus for a project manager, but the number one thing I would say as a project manager, you have to be adaptable. You have to know what your values are and know the kind of project manager you want to be while also saying, okay, things are going to change. You know, things are going to hit the fan that I can't say, but, you know, things are going to really um, transform and not to be overwhelmed by that transformation, but see it as an opportunity to, to challenge yourself. It's, that's a word too. adaptability in the face of challenge. That's, that's great. Um, yeah, I'm thinking particularly when doing this type of community-based collaboration, partnership work, there's so much change and transformation that has to happen. Um, with your kind of perspective from that bird's eye view, um, what is your relationship to these community partnerships and how does that kind of play a role in, in your motivation for the work that you're doing? So if it wasn't for community partnerships, I probably wouldn't be in project management because obviously we know that there's corporate project management, there's construction project management, there's so many different types. But for me, it's really about Am I able to, even by taking notes in a meeting or sending a reminder email or 
listening to a community partner just vent about how frustrating the financial process is with a big university and its bureaucracy. So all of those things, if I'm able to contribute to the quality of life of a community and of an individual as well, um, that is what gets me out of the bed, excited to do another day of lots of emails, lots of one-on-ones, lots of meetings, and lots of follow-up. I always laugh that like after every meeting, I have so much more work. So to be able to function and to be able to, you know, openly and happily take on that work, it really has to be centered on communities. I love that these spaces have so many um, touching missions that are so nuanced and unique to that space. Um, and that just through simple, you know, I think the logistics, everyone, not everyone, because I challenge, I'm a challenge dreamer. I I don't dream too big. So I'm like, okay, if I can do this, that's great. And then I'll get that easily because it wasn't really a dream. It was a task or a goal, right? But to work with dreamers and to be able to be that grounding factor that says, I will take the notes. I will ask the questions. I will assign these action items. That structure is hard to find. And that self-starter nature of like, let me help you. Don't worry. You don't have to ask. I'm here. Let me walk you through this. Um, and I experienced that with Plantation Park Heights on the several grants that we're working with them on. They're so talented. They're a farm. So they're constantly in touch with the earth, which is something that I admire and I would want more of because, of course, I'm at a computer all the time. But maybe their strengths are not documenting every decision and reporting and making sure that we are writing concept papers for the next grant. Like, if that's not their strength, because they're not born and bred in academia in a very ivory white tower that we all are in, um, then that's where I can step in and say, oh, no, I can help with, you know, taking notes and reporting. I can help with just formatting a document and spending a couple hours or days just working on a document to make sure that it's down to one page. Like that time that people don't have to do that, it's nice to step in and say, well, that's my strength. That's where I can step in. And I think um, just being able to learn from the communities to build friendships, professional friendships, um, and to know that, okay, no one might know who I am when I pull up to the farm, but I know that I'm making a difference here when I'm home clickety clacking on my computer. And I think um, communities just make all the difference because they bring such a new energy, especially in the academic field. Like you kind of get stale, you're learning the same things, but some of my favorite projects funded in part by Henry Luce Foundation has been like, wow, we're getting these kids out of the classroom. They're going to be at this farm. They're going to be learning about how design is influenced by human behavior from the humans, from the people that, you know, not just some statistics. I know I'm going to come in and fix this, but to really um, highlight, like, this is a people-centered practice. And that's what I love about project management is that it's people-centered and that you are working with different people who have whole lives outside of this little task that I need them to complete. Um, and if I really remain curious, that's when I get the most out of it. Thank you. That's wonderful. I think, um, yeah, it's interesting because I feel like to a lot of people, some of the tasks that you're describing wouldn't come across as people centered, right? That kind of the logistics, the the formatting, all those sorts of things. But yeah, I think like shifting your, you are, you're kind of that link between all of these people and holding them together. Um, so I've gotten to see you in action a little bit, um, doing our, our retreat planning mode, um, for the, the loose COVID-19 emergency grant retreat that met in Kalamazoo. Um, what was that experience like for you? Um, cause I know you, you were kind of like us at IDCL, you kind of stepped in after the fact and, but then you got to really participate in this retreat. So, so what kind of stood out for you about that? Well, to start, I loved working with you and Tiffany and Jorge and Harold, and I just learned so much. And Teresa, I learned so much from just the planning process. One of my favorite things to do, which again is its whole own job, but if you're at a small nonprofit, it becomes your job, um, is this events planning and retreat planning and convening planning. Like when people come together, who's walking them through that journey? 
And how many months in advance are you planning that so that it's just an easier time for everyone because you've thought of things and you're able to be flexible through your planning. So I learned so much about that. I learned how to be even more systematic and um, in the weeds of the details and see how, especially from Jorge, how that feeds into the culture of a retreat and what people are able to take away from it because oh, we thought about this question. Oh, well, if we word it like that, that won't work. Or if we have breakfast too early, like just the timing things. Oh, people need time to just go wander and walk around and reflect before jumping into the next session. Um, and then I totally have stolen that whole outline of the day. I use that for my own retreats, for my own events, just not being, you know, as a project manager, you're like a little raccoon. Everywhere you go, you're learning something, you're taking it for yourself, you're it's it's letting you um, learn and grow as a project manager, just watching everyone in different fields doing different um, things and approaches. So that was really exciting. It was cool to be able to feel purposeful and take those minutes and say, okay, I'm documenting what these incredible people are saying, these incredible educators and um, learning from that. And also having support from IDCL and knowing that, okay, it's not all on me to be the main project manager because you guys were doing your great running of things. And the actual retreat itself, I mean, what an awesome opportunity to be in nature, to learn from a lot of amazing people and community partners, which or academics and folks that are in the institution meeting with community partners and learning about their projects as well as their disappointments, the gaps, which is always really interesting to me. I love learning about what folks thought could go better and the ways in which the institution will never be everything we need it to be and never really be, you know, that perfect conduit for connecting with communities. Um, and also, because I'm a sociologist by, you know, trade, so that's where I come from. So learning about those discrepancies and then also seeing some of the hopes and seeing what they've been able to accomplish. And I think what I've learned from that session was also like, wow, what a difference it makes to just give people money without stipulation. And just that honesty, like you never want to say that in a report, like just give us more money. But that freedom and knowing that our funders were there, Jonathan was there with HLF. Um, it was cool to hear like we are really being honest. And for once, it feels like, although it, there's more than once, um, it felt like these philanthropic funders were really meeting us and saying like, well, what really happened? We really want to know how it went, especially because COVID and the COVID rapid relief grants, you know, that is that opportunity might not come again where philanthropic organizations is like, just take the money, just go. So I thought it was a really um, fascinating seminar and, and retreat to be part of because of the authenticity, the honesty, Again, everything pretty much being planned. I was supporting, I was taking notes on my laptop at times, but just being able to be an active participant because I had, we had already planned everything and everything was running smoothly. Um, and also, like you said, coming in at the end of that, and like this is the, my, one of my first introductions to what this COVID rapid relief grant was about coming with that fresh perspective and seeing my organization, the Center for Religion and Cities, we've grown into like a beautiful organization based on that first grant. Like that was one of our trampolines that launched us into who we are today and all of the grants and communities that we're working with. So it was cool to see like, oh, this is where it started and to learn from other projects across the country. Um, and I'm really, always focused on what worked and what would change because I'm going to get my next grant with an organization. The next project is going to come and I have to keep all of those lessons in mind. I'm a younger sibling. I'm the youngest in my family. And there's always that joke, you know, you never want to hear your older sibling or your parent tell you, you know, oh, this is easier. Don't do this. You kind of have to do it. Experience it yourself. But as a project manager, if you can just learn and, and really apply some of that knowledge, I always have for every grant a document that says like lessons learned, what worked, what didn't, so that I don't have to go and repeat history and make the same mistakes. It really does save you time. It saves you a headache. And you, especially as institutions, these communities already have a negative perception of us. They already think we're just coming in. I loved the person at the retreat who said, like, as an institution, we're coming with a measly bottle of wine 
forcing ourselves into this dinner and saying, well, aren't you going to thank me for bringing this wine? Like, you know, we kind of come and, and people have that perception of we just take, take, take. We just, you know, for here for a grant, gone the next moment, not really trying to build community. And so we have a reputation that we need to change. And so to make it easier for them, the pay process is so important, making sure that your communities are getting paid. We all know the bureaucracies that we're connected to. And so we need to make that easier and we're used to it, right? I'm in this, I'm in the system, you know, I can just handle it, whatever. If, it's, if my paycheck's a little late, but these communities, they can't afford that. Their rent is riding on this one check that you said was going to come. And so I think those moments that I was able to grab from that. And, and I also loved, I'm a young person, I'm a zillennial. So learning from elders in the field was really inspiring because I heard a lot of the same frustrations that I feel as a naive, hopeful, why is the system like this? To know that like people who have multiple PhDs have been at institutions for decades, that they're still fighting and feeling those same things was really, um, it gave me hope and it led me to want to work with these people more. Like, hey, maybe the people who are the foot soldiers of the institution, they're not so bad. And maybe they they do have that hope that things can change. So that, those were some of my best takeaways. The food was amazing. The Fetzer Institute was awesome. And it was just nice to step away. And I, I've been starting to think about writing that into grants for the community partners that we're working with. Maybe we can't go to Kalamazoo, but we can you know, rent out a room and have a weekend where we're just like, let's just lock in, let's reflect, let's plan, let's step away. Because it's so hard for the communities and our partners to step away from the hustle and bustle of their small organizations. Um, so to really build that time into a grant, I learned that that was necessary during this project. Yeah, it was a very interesting event in that it was kind of that that moment of of care and reflection after something was done. And normally, right, we're, we're used to the reporting and that's not very human, right? A lot of times it is just that reporting in a document, sending off the email, getting the check of approval. Um, so it was, it was very different to kind of have this more human moment to not just gather together, but to reflect on the work that had been done. Um, I'm thinking also about your, your comment that you, you know, you have your lessons learned document uh, after each kind of grant. What are some other like tips and tricks that you've picked up over the years of like that really just kind of like help things function more smoothly or help you feel more confident even in the work that you're doing? Yeah, so a couple documents. First, the internet is our friend. You know, I learned from a project manager mentor how silly he thought it was to go to college or to get a master's in project management when the best teacher will be experienced. So, you know, the internet and, and all these research tools that you can look up once I say these words will definitely help. I would say a new program or a new project worksheet is a great place to start. That's where you figure out what are the goals of this project? What is, why are we starting this? Who is this meant to serve? Who's leading the project, which sometimes People will say they're leading and then they vanish. So, you, you know, like making sure you're holding folks accountable. Um, what are the goals? What are the objectives? How will you know it's been successful? So is it this many people? Is it people say this? What are the metrics that are you that you're using to measure the success of the project? What's the timeline from start to finish? Um, and then being able to break that down into more of like, what are each of the tasks that we need to do in order to get from this point to this point from that new project diagram and then you'll develop that task based worksheet um, you'll create a critical path diagram which is where you can then map out okay from all of these tasks let's put them in order what can happen at the same time what needs to happen before this can happen and you'll be able to get from start to finish what I learned back in the day um, from my sister, who's amazing at organizing and communities, was like work backwards, like your opening day, you're talking to the community, you're launching the project, what needs to happen the day before, the week before, the month before, and go backwards to where you are in that moment. Just several ways to plan out every little step and get as detailed as possible as, as you can, right? So from a critical path diagram, yeah, just having a clear 
you know, you don't have to create a Gantt chart. It's super easy to do it on Excel where it can track people's progress, you know, although I had to learn how to do one from scratch, which is pretty crazy and very old school, but powerful. Um, but just any way to measure, like, where are we in the grant? People do sticky notes. They'll like, is this task done? We're moving it to the done pile, new sticky notes onto the wall, whatever visual representation you have for the course that you are running on. Um, so that it's less of that building the plane while we're flying it. Oh, I didn't realize. Let me run and do that. Like having trying to have that um, for foresight. Um, what else? I would say, oh, with that new program worksheet, making sure that all of the PIs or you know stakeholders sign off on it. So that becomes a contract saying, this is what I'm doing because you might notice at times things either get added to. So it's like, oh, let's do this, let's do this. And people are really excited about how the project is unfolding and wanna add to it. Well, hey, we all signed off that this is gonna be what we said we were gonna do. This is where we're gonna stick now and let's save those dreams. I think it's always important for the dreamers to see that we are recording their dreams and that they know like, okay, next grant. When we get more money, we'll be able to do that. Let's do this successfully so we can report and get that next grant. Um, what else has been really helpful? I think just a simple contact list that you can provide to community partners and that you can also have for yourself. Who is the person to call? And trying to find so that it's not always you. If they can call someone else for payroll at, at any moment, if they can call someone else, um, listing the PIs, having that space. I've noticed that community partners, they like to just pick up the phone and call. They're not so based in email. I mean, good luck sending an email to some of our community partners. It might take them a couple weeks to get to it because they're dealing with people in person, they're hopping on the phone, they're sending a text. And I sometimes get a little nervous about that, but making sure that it's clear, you know, just for the sanity and for the that transparency and that faith in the institution, I will pick up your call, even if all I can say is, I'm sorry, I can't push payroll to go faster, right? Um, what else has been super helpful? You know, before every big project, I'd like to create a, a small manual, just a couple pages that says like, who are we as an institution? Why are we doing this? It has that contact information. It may have some type of pay schedule or program schedule, um, just so that folks, there's an easy document that folks can have their answers, their questions answered, um, especially because we work with fellows. We call it like a fellows manual um, and things like that. I would say, you know, finding good templates for contracts and finding good templates and not being scared to develop some policies. I think that there might be a lot of moving pieces. And so that lessons learned can then in the hindsight be, okay, well, here's a policy that we can adopt. We're always gonna send, you know, something that we had to learn is we're not gonna put on people's contracts when we think they're gonna get paid. Cause Lord knows one thing, you know, the domino just doesn't fall and everything's a month late. And they were waiting for that month so that they could pay some bills. So being clear, okay, my institution might take you three to four months because it's better to get a check sooner than later and to expect it and, you know, expect it to come months from now when it comes in the mail. That's a lot better than, you know, the fear of not being able to meet your needs and just not adding to that institutional harm. Um, so the lessons learned as you're, do that as you're working on things. If anything's been frustrating, if anything's been, and, you know, sometimes it's just a venting sheet for me that then gets put into like a, a real list that we can learn from and I can share publicly with people. Task tracking, I know it seems a little like surveillance state, but it's helped me feel confident that I'm putting in the time that I need to put in and that I'm required to put in and to really see, oh my goodness, I did like 20 things this week. Whoa, like maybe there something needs to change. Maybe I need to work on one project at a time or, you know, it helps you reflect on how many hours are you actually working it's been hard for me to implement that with other people. They have their own ways of tracking their hours and time. Um, but for me, it's been nice to hold myself accountable and also give myself kudos and say like, you can take a 30 minute extra long lunch break. Like you've been doing a lot. You've been on top of things. I think um, just finding a system that if everyone's on Google Suite, then using Google Suite. If everyone's gonna be on MS you know, Office, then trying to find a way that folks um, can have their commitments like this. It's in my Google calendar. I can see it. And that's something that's really helpful and not to be underestimated. But again, if you're not 
logging into your Gmail, you're definitely not going to see your calendar. So don't be afraid to five minutes or 10 minutes before the day before call up your, um, and that also goes back to the contact sheet. It's not just for the community partners to see the institution people. It's also like, I need to have every person that's a community partner that I need to talk to on a list so I can just do those phone banking calls, which is part of my organizing history. So it's not, that's not such a crazy concept for me to like run out and just do a bunch of calls in a day to check in with community partners, but having that all in one place. And then I think one of the last things I'll say is I have really learned, you know, this, how important this is as I'm expanding in my project management KPIs, key performance indicators. And that goes back to like, what are our goals? How will we know we're successful? And people really want to see the numbers. So for example, for our Life Ways of Hope initiative by HLF, we have, uh, we just are starting a fellowship on public scholarship, which is really exciting. And I noticed that we missed this opportunity. We got 65 applicants, which wow, for a small organization like the center, we were not expecting that. But as it started coming in, I was like, well, what were we expecting? We never set a number of how many applicants we really wanted that we would feel like we were successful. So I had to do that in hindsight and say, well, I think that it would have been like 25 would have been enough for us. But we got, you know, who's to say in that moment, um, if we didn't say this is what we wanted, this is the number and not being scared of the numbers and not being scared to say we want this percentage of, you know, attendance or, you know, little surveys, I would say just getting comfortable with Google Forms and having surveys because those community surveys in the moment, I'm also reporting for another grant, we're having to go back and ask people that event in June of last year in the winter, I'm asking folks about June and April and, you know, getting them in the moment, especially if you're going to be offering community partners money for attending events or participating in things, making the surveys mandatory in order to get that compensation, just so that you have an easier time when you're reporting and you're not scrambling to find little blurbs that you can pull from people um, when it's fresh in the mind. Um, I would say that's, I think that's, going to start you off well if you're in project management and again like just researching I think I've pulled so much helpful stuff even from places like indeed.com and like they'll, these places that want you to buy their project management programs you don't need to buy it they're giving you some really helpful um, tools that you can then develop I often go to TikTok to like how do I do this and how can they have project management TikTok is super helpful. It's on YouTube. It's on, I'm sure it's on Instagram, just finding ways to um, ask those questions and, and get those forms. And it's okay if it's messy, if it doesn't work out. And I would say that if you are introducing this, you're switching up the culture in your workplace. So you might have to say, actually, every new project that happens needs to fill out this form. I don't care if you're going to take minute, if I'm going to be there taking minutes, that's not enough in a new meeting where we're talking about this with a partner, like we need to set aside time to fill out this new program worksheet. So just not being afraid to be a little firm and say, we're going to do this. This is going to help us when we're reporting. This is going to help our community partners get more funding that they need. And just keeping that, because again, no one wants to fill out a report. No one wants to fill out a project worksheet, but making it clear, hey, if you care about this community partner that you say you care about as an institution, this will help. They're not going to fill this out. We're going to sit down and fill this out, make their life easier and get them that money and that space that they need to do the work that they're here to do, and that's making their communities better. I love your passion for this. <laughs> it's so fun. And it's, and it's also, it's making me really think to like, you know, for, for academics who are writers, it's kind of like that, the work that you have to put into citations, right? Nobody wants to do it, but it's way easier if you do it ahead of time than if you wait until the end, right? It's that kind of planning and, and documenting, showing the work that you've done. Um, and that's what I've learned with the center. I will jump in and say, you know, I have this joke. I work with professors and professors are not project managers. And I think that's okay. Professors and, and students and writers and academics, you know, PhD, what is it? ABDs, like they have so many gifts and it might not be project management, but again, I, I'm, an, I'm a musician. So I work on albums and I've learned, oh, project management helps me with my album process. It helps me with my community organizing process, asking those questions and 
you know, just being very transparent because I think we we want to do right by our community partners and we want to say like, I got this, I'll be there for you. But if this is one of your first times doing something, let them know, hey, be patient with me. I'm new at this. I want to do right by you. I'm always going to have that phone free. I've had people call me at seven in the morning. I'm like, I'm not clocked in yet. I'll answer the phone or I'll let it go to voicemail. I'll listen to the voicemail, then I'll call them back, right? So just making sure that you're clear that, I want to do right by you. I want us to achieve these dreams together. I'm new at this. So let's work together and, and we'll see what they have. Because again, these community partners, they might be doing a little more project management than we are on our side. So um, just taking it easy. You know, I think that's what I've learned because we are definitely diving in um, at our at our center, at least, and, you know, having to get that training. So not to underestimate even just a YouTube training, you know. Yeah, it's it's like, for academics, particularly, as you were saying, they may not have these gifts or they may, but particularly if you're an academic and you're trying to do this community-based work, it's again, it's it's you have to be able to wear these many hats and, and pick up these skills and tools where you can. Um, so we've got just a little bit more time left. And I wanted to, to give you some space to think about. So for those folks that this is not their gift, <laughs> it is not the thing that they get them excited or help, not the reason why they wake up in the morning. Um, what are some things that you would, words of encouragement or motivation um, for folks? You've already kind of said a lot about why this work is important, but but what would you do to, to be that little cheerleader, I guess? Yeah, it's something that I loved in a training I did was like, if you have ever made an omelet, if you've ever made, you know, pasta for dinner, you've participated in some form of project management, you know, you're planning, you know, that you can't, you know, I don't know, what, in, what can't you do? You can't serve the plate before you break the egg, right? So you've done that, like, okay, I know I have to do this thing before this and that, and just seeing it in those simple terms, I... I think it's just so important. It is one of those jobs that um, it's challenging. Lots of patience is needed. I'll say that a thousand times. Um, patience with yourself. You know, even me, I, I've realized that project management is a stretch position. Even for me, who's so passionate and interested in it, and realizing, oh, this is my thing, um, it's a stretch. It's you're going to be put in situations that you know, will challenge you and, and will make you question like, oh, am I really the good guy? But, you know, I think just knowing that the communities, they need it. Your, whoever your academic um, or philanthropic funding team is, they need this. This is a key part in what makes things run smoothly. And that's important because it will alleviate those headaches. It'll alleviate that doubt. Um, and I don't know what other words of encouragement can I can I offer? I think it's one of those things that you know you want to have. I said that sibling thing earlier, and it, uh, you still have to go experience it and make mistakes and realize that you're human and be frustrated. That's all part of the process. So if you end the workday work trying to get this community engagement thing off the ground and you're frustrated, you're a successful project manager. You know, success looks very different because it's so based on the day, based on the moment, based on the community partner. Um, and that's that adaptability. Like I made that joke that I don't, you know, I don't love the building the airplane while you're flying it, but that's so part of it. You're just gonna have to do that. And maybe you just know that some parts, okay, at least the control break is not the part that I'm building. Cause I didn't mention this. And I, this is one of the most important things is the risk assessment making sure that you're listing out all your risks and you're finding ways to manage like, oh no, maybe people won't be paid on time. Maybe this community partner will drop out. Well, what will I do if that happens? So throw that into the part where, you know, we're talking about things that are helpful, risk management, risk assessments, and just Googling that and seeing what that looks like. Um, but encouragement. Yeah. You know, this is, this is so exciting because it is a space where academics can say like, wow, I really don't know something. I, I mean, I know academics have that energy too in their own field, but it's it's an opportunity to learn new skills. It's an opportunity to approach life in a different way and to, yeah, become more people-centered. And sometimes that just means helping people, helping people by 
filling out a contract for them because they haven't been on a laptop since the 90s or, you know, like really supporting folks in hand holding them. And I think another way you can help yourself is maybe finding someone who can hold your hand through the process. It might not be a, a project management mentor, but surely a mentor who you say, hey, the first 30 minutes of every conversation, I just need to vent. And that has really helped me through my first few years is having a supervisor who I can just like, and no, 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 and no, 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 and this happened. And, you know, I felt that too, where it's like, I don't want to let people down. Like, am I letting people down? But I think having that space and allowing yourself to have that space where folks compliment you and say, wow, these are some of the best notes that I've ever seen anyone take. And I've been in this forever. And I know we try to downplay that, but there's this joke that if a project goes wrong, it's you. If a project goes wrong, I did it. It was Santana's project, what happened? But if a project goes right, everyone's gonna take credit. It was team effort, we all pitched in. You know, so to really take those moments when someone compliments you and to take that to heart and say, wow, like, and to ask your community partners, like, what have you enjoyed? What have, what's been a challenge? What could I work on? And allowing that space for feedback, because that's where I get some of my best compliments that make me feel like, oh, yeah, I want to keep being that person that people see me as. And they might not say it in the moment, but if you allow that space during a survey, during um, a reporting process, like, give them that space to congratulate you. And again, like these community partners are my community partners. Just thinking about mine, they're up at 5 a.m. Being on the news in Baltimore, you know, running a program, they're doing so much. So to take this part off of their hands is really rewarding. And I feel like, wow, again, I might pull up and nobody knows me. I have to reintroduce myself. People are looking at me crazy. Um, but I know, oh, I know in my heart that like I did all of the meeting notes for everything. I've done all the reporting for this community partner and that that can feel good too. And of course, I think taking breaks, taking boundaries, you know, I had to turn Google off. I don't get any Google notifications on my phone because I will, it'll be 11 p.m. I'm scrolling on TikTok. I see an email and I respond. So I think part of creating that distance will help make the work more tangible and of course you know the whole thing about you can't eat an elephant all at once you got to slice it you got to chop it up um just knowing that you need to make it bite-sized for yourself um and what i will say is i think this is this might not be the best for academics depending on the personality but if you can smile if you can i hear you thank you if you can come with a personality or an energy that is um kind is maybe a little humorous maybe a little serious at times, you know, that personality goes a long way. And that's not something you can teach or look up. But if you can come and say, I'm going to take this moment to practice just smiling and thanking these community partners for being willing to work with us, who are we, right? So to really have that moment, um, that shines through. And then any mistake you make, well, I know that they're a good person. At least I know they're they're great. They're kind. They always come with me with respect. That's a big one. Just coming with respect, I think that is good. But yeah, I, I just think project management is everything. It is if you're planning a party, if you're looking up directions to get somewhere, all of this feeds into that. And so to see it like, oh, project manager is a lot bigger. And again, maybe not calling yourself a project manager, maybe stepping back because that's maybe some big shoes to fill for certain people. So to step back and say, oh, I'm the community liaison. I'm, you know, the PI on this project that might help it's the same work possibly, but it might help. Okay, at least I don't have to like take on this idea of like I'm the big project manager. I have to do all these things. I have to know all these things. I have to be using all these tools. Well, just take it one step at a time. And if you're able to learn from what worked and what didn't, I mean, the next day will be better. So just staying teachable. I love that about academics. They're always got their nose and some new information. They're always trying to learn something. And and this is that opportunity to learn in a hands-on way. And if it's challenging for you, it's challenging for the community partners and you can really help them walk through this process. That's wonderful, thank you. I feel like we got like a lightning round masterclass. Um, I love so I that. really appreciate it. Um, and with that, I'm gonna stop the recording.